Okay, we seem to be live. All right, uh, I guess we'll get started. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, you know, we're, we set up our live stream, so if you can't hear us or having any problems, make sure to just comment in the chat and we have people moderating it, so we'll be able to sort it out. Uh, but yeah, again, thank you for coming. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about the InSight Lander, uh, which is a Mars lander designed to study the internal structure of the planet through uh, things like seismic activity and whatnot. And uh, the three of us here are gonna be divvying up the talks. So you'll be hearing from all of us. Uh, I'm John, I'm a TA here. I studied astrophysics. Um, and uh, Anna and Darcy, can you introduce yourselves? Darcy, you can go if you want. Um, I'm Darcy, I'm also a TA. Uh, I'm here, I'm at the University of Minnesota studying plant science and astrophysics. I'm Anna Bolt. I'm a third year aerospace engineering student at the University of Minnesota, and I'm also a TA. All right. All right, so I'll just give a brief background for the talk and why we're doing it. Uh, so, We've always, you know, since we got good telescopes, we've known a good deal about what the surface of Mars looks like. So we, we know about, you know, the ice at the poles, the weather patterns, you know, the, the plains and the mountains, things like Olympus Mons. So we have a good understanding of what the surface looks like. But that is only a very, very small piece of the planet. And often things that are, you know, driving what, the stuff that's driving what you see on the surface, a lot of it is on the inside. Um, and we don't know much about the inside of Mars for the main reason that we've never had an instrument that can look at the inside of Mars before. So there's a bunch of questions that we've had about what, what, what's on the inside of Mars. Like, what is it made of? What is the structure? You know, if you look at like a diagram, the internal structure of the Earth, you see things like a mantle, a core, an outer core, a crust, stuff like that. So, you know, we we don't we didn't really we don't really know what the internal structure of Mars is. And then there's the question of whether it's seismically active. So, are there earthquakes or Mars quakes? I guess. And is there volcanic activity still, or is it still a dead planet? And finally, you know, like what's the temperature of the inside of Mars and how is heat flowing to the outside? Because that tells you sort of how it's cooling off, which kind of is similar to asking, is there volcanic activity? 
because the more a planet cools off, the less volcanic activity it'll have. Um, so the reason we care about this is, for one, if we can understand, you know, how Mars formed, and if we can understand, if we can have data on the insides of two terrestrial rocky planets, so we understand the Earth well, if we can get data about this on Mars too, then we can kind of understand how rocky planets are formed. So this is relevant to how the Earth was formed, relevant to how Venus was formed, relevant to how Mercury was formed, and probably even some of the moons. But this is just an important question, both for studying the Earth and just planetology. Also, I, I'm a big fan of the, the word Marsquake which is part of why I wanted to do this talk. So here we are. All right. So INSIGHT stands for Interior Exploration Using Seismic Investigations, Geodesy, and Heat Transport. So um, essentially what it's doing is it's doing two big things. It's looking for earthquakes and tremors. So that's the seismic investigations and it's it tried to measure, you know, the heat transport by, you know, getting an idea of what the internal temperature of Mars is. Um, and both of, you know, doing both of those things will tell us a lot about these two goals, which is understand the formation and evolution of Mars and its internal structure. And secondly, measure the seismic activity and figure out, you know, how, how many Mars quakes are there and stuff like that. What's going on in the inside of Mars? And InSight has already done with its main mission. It had a two-year mission, um, but it landed on Mars in 2018, in November 2018. So it's through its two-year mission and more into its extended operation period. Uh, but so far, it's had some pretty interesting results, and we're going to summarize these for you. And the last thing I'll say here is just about this idea of using seismic waves to uh, understand the internal structure. Um, seismic waves are essentially like sound waves. They're vibrations in materials. So they're just very, very low frequency sound waves. And waves like this interact differently with different types of materials. You know, this, this depends on things like the density, which determines, say, the speed of sound in that material. So the waves will do things like reflect and refract from different materials. So if there's some internal structure to Mars, then that would mean there's different materials at different depths. So you could conceivably do something like what we've done on Earth. And you could study, these are basically examples of if there's an earthquake, you can see all of these lines are waves that have been reflected and refracted off of the internal structure of, of, of the Earth. So, you know, there's an earthquake and you have all these waves that bounce around. And if you accurately count and study these waves, you can get an idea of what the inside of the Earth looks like. So the hope is that you can do something similar, you can do something similar with Mars. And that's sort of what insight is there to do. All right. And I'm going to pass it off to Anna now. OK, I'm not. I had one more slide. I'm sorry. Um, so this is just a map of the different things that we've put on Mars. And you can see uh, InSight is here in the, it's called Elysium Planitia. And it was chosen for safety reasons. It's pretty flat, so it's easier to land a, land something there because they're trying to study the inside of Mars, it doesn't matter so much where you put it. So they chose it based on safety reasons. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Anna. So firstly, I wanted to talk about the surface features of Mars. Um, as we know now, Mars is definitely not Earth-like in its outer appearance, but over three to 4 billion years ago, the surfaces of Mars and Earth were actually believed to be very similar um, in that both of their atmospheres contained heat and moisture. Um, and now scientists are trying to understand through um, the internal structure of Mars 
if its starting materials allowed for it to support life. So InSight, as John said, was created to study what the features under the surface of Mars are. And by analyzing the layering and the thermodynamics of the crust, or whether or not Mars is still emitting heat from its crust, um, will help find out how quickly the heat has left the surface and if heat is still leaving the surface. So Mars can be divided into two major geographies. There are heavily cratered highlands in the south and then smoother lowlands in the north where InSight was landed. And this smoother northern hemisphere is thought to be resurfaced by volcanism in the north. Um, but some scientists do think that it could have possibly been filled by an ocean in the past. Mars also lacks plate tectonics. Um, Earth with earthquakes, they're caused by the plate shifting on top of one another or pulling apart from one another. Mars lacks that, so there's no horizontal motion of the plates. So Mars is known to have very large volcanoes because the crust sits over these chambers of molten rock and just continually builds layer upon layer of molten rock to build large volcanoes like Olympus Mons, for example, rather than the many small volcanoes we see on Earth. This is just a picture of what the InSight lander carries um, before going on to talk a little more about the instrumentation of it. So as you see from the picture, it has a grapple radio antenna um, seismometer for with a wind and thermal shield um, to measure earthquakes and the vibrations under the surface, a heat flow probe and different cameras and solar panels for power. So the seismometer measures the pulse of Mars by studying the waves created by Mars quakes. Uh, it also studies the waves created by meteorite impacts and surface vibrations from wind and dust storms that are common on Mars. There's also an HP3, which stands for a heat flow and physical properties package. This takes the temperature of the surface of Mars to see if heat is escaping or if heat is flowing from the interior of the planet to the exterior. Um, this is known as the mole, which is a heat probe that ended its mission on Mars due to incompatibility with the soil, which I'll talk about a little bit later. There's also the RISE, which stands for Rotation and Interior Structure Experiment. This actually tracks the wobble of the North Pole due to the sun's gravitational pull in the orbit. And this can help scientists determine the size and composition of the core or if Mars has different layers in its core um, similar to Earth would. And then as we saw in the picture before, there are also deployment arms, uh, wind and temperature gauges, grapples, and various cameras and antennas to track the mission. And again, this is just an idea of what the InSight looks like. So you can see the heat flow probe going into the surface of Mars, um, the size instrument covered by the shield, the HP3 is on the bottom right, and then the various antennas and sensors at the top. So talking about the mole, as you can see from this image on the right, it gives you an idea of the mole trying to enter the Martian atmosphere. I know they had trouble actually getting the probe to go under the surface because in past missions for different rovers, they actually encountered soil that had similar properties to the sandy texture that we might see on Earth. Um, in this case, where they were deploying InSight they actually found that this soil was more clay-like and sticky than the soil that they'd observed and designed the mole for in past missions. And so as you can see in the picture, as the hook tries to dig into the soil, the soil actually clumps around and pushes the mole back out of the soil. And so 
This was a heat probe designed and built by the German Aerospace Center. And they wanted to take the internal temperature of the planet. That was the point of needing to dig at least 10 feet into the soil to measure the heat flow. And with the clumping, they decided on January 9th to get give one more go to get the mole into the soil to start taking the temperature of the planet. And after 500 hammer strokes on January 9th, they decided to end that mission due to no progress. Um, and lastly, I will talk about volcanism of the planet. Recently, the scientists believe that Mars's ancient lava flows actually appear to only have ended a few thousand, tens of thousands of years ago. Um, in the past, they thought that Mars has been a dead planet for much longer than that. InSight has had some data hit or miss that's measured many seismic signals. And this might suggest the presence of magma under the surface, which would mean that Mars could still be a volcanically active world in the solar system. Olympus Mons is the largest of the Martian volcanoes. And just for size comparison, it is three times higher than Mount Everest and weighs enough that it actually has sank down into the crust of Mars and formed a moat around the base of it. And this has, was thought to be filled with lava in the past. Um, now it's just kind of a divot around the base. And I believe I read that if you would place Olympus Mons on Earth, it would stretch between Boston and Washington DC with how large the base of it is. The discovery of the volcanic activity is justified by finding patterns of lava flow around the base of Olympus Mons and also various spiral patterns that they see on the crust of Mars that are similar to those found near volcanic activity on the Earth. And as we stated before, this volcanic um, activity actually cools planets down the more heat that's released from the core. And so by trying to deploy devices like the mole and to dig them into Mars as heat sensors, they're actually trying to see if Mars happens to still be releasing the internal heat. Oh, this is not my last slide either, John. <laughs> okay. So insights, insight on Mars. So the heat flow instrument, magnetometer and seismometer allow for the insight to pick up seismic rumbles. Some of these activities are due to fault slipping or cracks forming on the planet's surface. Others they have not found to have a clear source, which is why they're thinking that it's possible magma might be moving below the surface. And scientists are analyzing these vibrations and oscillations read by the seismometer to look for high and low frequency oscillations. And so they're searching for low frequency events that are associated with moving magma, but the weak signals that they find more often than not aren't providing them enough information to definitively say whether or not it's magma moving below the surface. Um, and then lastly, an analogy that I read that I felt found super helpful for understanding the frequencies that they're searching for says when liquid magma moves through a conduit the conduit vibrates just like when you push air through your vocal cords. And when your vocal cords vibrate and you make a sound and then you would possibly suck on a helium balloon and make that same sound, um, that sound would change between water or magma due to the viscosity of that. And so scientists are looking for those low frequency oscillations um, as a means to find magma, which is more viscous than water. Uh, so since InSight landed, there have been some Mars shaking discoveries. Um, since uh, April 2019, a lot of Mars quakes have been detected, um, although none of them are large, have been larger than a magnitude 3.7. Uh, just for reference, the weakest earthquake that a human can feel is about a magnitude 2. Um, so these are all fairly weak Mars quakes. Uh, even though they've been pretty frequent, um, sometimes up to one per day, 
Uh, there have been long months where none were detected. Uh, scientists think that this is because of the wind on Mars. Um, like Anne mentioned, and like you can see in the picture on the right, uh, the seismometer does have a wind and heat shield um, that does protect it from the elements. Uh, but the wind can also move the ground itself, um, which would cover up any Mars quakes that they would have detected. Um, they've also detected some interesting things about those Mars quakes. Um, quakes can, can have um, waves on the planet's interior uh, called P waves and S waves, uh, but they can also have waves along the surface um, or the crust, which are called surface waves. Um, strangely, none of the detected Mars quakes have had any surface waves. Um, the two possible explanations for this are that um, either Mars's crust is really fractured, uh, which would make the waves bounce around a lot um, and be more difficult to detect, or it could mean that the, all the detected quakes just happen to come from very deep within the planet, um, which would um, very deep Mars quakes wouldn't produce a lot of strong surface waves. Um, some other fun things they found um, is that the Mars soil varies a lot. Um, at the previous Mars missions, uh, like we had mentioned, the soil had been much more sandy and the mole was designed with that in mind. But now um, with this new location, there is the soil is much more clay and it's getting difficult to, um, sorry, my cat. Is distracting. Um, so it was difficult for the mole to work in that soil. Um, over the two-year process of trying to sh troubleshoot with the mole, um, they also used that robotic arm in a lot of ways that it was not really intended to be used. Um, so they're actually now using that to help protect the tether to the seismometer. So um, in the little gif, the seismometer is the small thing on the ground and it's got that little line leading towards it. Uh, that tether is what provides data and power to the seismometer. Um, it's been experiencing some issues because of temperature changes um, that have been causing popping and cracking sounds within the um, seismic data. So they're going to be using some of the techniques that they learned from trying to pat the mold into the ground to use that arm to dig and bury the uh, bury that tether so it's a little more protected from the elements. Um, they've also been monitoring um, things like temperature, air pressure, wind speed, um, so you can get actual uh, weather measurements from Mars. Currently, we aren't getting that information um, because there is, um, Mars is not at a great position right now. Um, next slide. No, I'm controlling the screen. Cool. Um, currently, uh, with its position in its orbit around the sun and all the dust on the solar panels, they're only getting about 27% of their dust-free capacity. So um, power is being prioritized to the heaters and radio communication. Uh, so they currently aren't taking a lot of scientific data. Um, it looks like the power levels, based on what it has right now, should get insight through the winter. Um, even if it doesn't, it is designed to reboot itself when there's enough sunlight, um, assuming that the electronics survive the cold winter. So things currently look good for InSight. Uh, starting in July, InSight is going to be getting more sunlight as Mars moves into its summer and closer to the sun. And also there will be more wind that will hopefully help to dust off those solar panels. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for around July when InSight is going to be able to pick back up and do a lot more stuff then. Um, the mission was also extended. Um, like John mentioned, it, the original mission was two years and lasted until 2020. And its mission has been extended until December 2022. Um, they'll be focusing on collecting longer term seismic data. Uh, so that would help with things like the theory that maybe all of the Mars quakes just happen to come from deep within Mars. Um, so as we get more data, that'll be uh, helpful. Um, they'll also be trying to deploy the HP3, the mole again, um, but that is very low priority and not super hopeful right now. Um, but 
maybe in the future, fingers crossed. Oops. Ignore that for a moment. Sorry, everyone. All right, so yeah, that's the conclusion of like the main body of our talk. So what we're going to do now is have a quick question and answer session. So we have uh, moderators moderating, looking at the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to type them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, and there, we, we, we're aware there's some legs, so we'll give you some time to put the questions in. Um, so we have gotten a question um, through YouTube uh, from Dale Trapp. Uh, what techniques are being tried to keep the solar panels dust free? Um, so I can answer that one unless either of you two are very inspired to answer it. Go for it. Um, so they essentially have been hoping um, that in the big kind of flat area of the of where they landed in sight, that any storms and wind would be helpful to uh, dust off the, um, the solar panels. Unfortunately, that has not happened so far, uh, but that is the hope. Um, that is the main thing that they're doing. Um, I always kind of feel like maybe they could put like the windshield wipers that we have on cars um, but I feel like that probably wouldn't work. I just like to imagine little windshield wipers on a Mars rover or a lander. All right, we have another question from uh, Dick Hendrickson. Um, so Anna said volcanoes cool the interior isn't the amount of lava from a volcano very small compared to the interior volume? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Anna, do you have anything like readily in mind? Um, I would say with that, that cooling the interior isn't necessarily like proportional to the amount of lava that comes from the volcano. Uh, volcanoes do cool the interior just because you have that airflow moving from the core of the planet out to um, the crust or out and escaping into the atmosphere. And so you're correct in saying the amount of lava from the volcano is very small compared to the interior volume. They do find that smaller planets cool down quicker from volcanic activity, um, similar like Mer Mercury, Earth, uh, Venus, Mars, the smaller interior planets would cool quicker than planets with a larger volume. Um, but I think it is the lava in conjunction with that airflow from the volcano that cools the planet down. Mm -hmm. And also another thing I'd add is, you know, 
Mars isn't really very volcanically active at all right now, but take the Earth that still is. So maybe one individual eruption doesn't do much, but over time, consistent volcanic activity could have a significant effect, even if any individual eruption is has a small effect. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we've got another question from Dick Hendrickson. Hendrickson. Um, is it surprising that the mole couldn't penetrate the soil? Did it just land on a rock? Um, is it likely that the soil varies widely from place to place? I guess I can answer from what I have read and understand. Uh, I believe scientists were surprised that the mole couldn't penetrate the soil. As I know Darcy mentioned, they tried to design the mole with respect to other previous missions and rovers that have landed on Mars to account for the sandier soil, to hammer into the soil, and to get, uh, I believe I said 10 feet under the surface. And by landing in these like flatter planes, I think they were surprised, much like I was, that the mole couldn't penetrate the soil. And so it landed in soil that was actually stickier or more clay-like than the sand that they expected. And so they didn't realize in designing that, that the soil of Mars varied widely from the more rocky regions to the plains. But I think they were as surprised designing it as we are to see the mole not able to get under the soil. Yeah, they um, intentionally picked this location for it uh, because just based on what they can see on the surface, there's not a lot of uh, rocks there. And the mole was designed so that it should be able to get like shove aside rocks smaller than I believe about four inches. So it should, if it had been um, just placed on a rock, got unlucky, um, that likely isn't the case um, and is something that they considered. Um, but yeah, this uh, it was super surprising that it's such different soil. Um, I Sorry, as a plant science person, I could talk a lot about soil, um, but I will stop myself just for everyone's safety. Uh, we'll give it one more minute for questions and then we'll move on to the post talk activity. Uh, but if you do have any questions, even when we're doing the activity, feel free to ask them. Okay, I think we'll move on, at least for now. Uh, one moment. All right, so what we're going to be doing is this uh, activity called Pie in the Sky from NASA. Uh, so, you know, it was Pi Day, uh, March 14th, 3 slash 14, uh, this last, earlier this week. 
So we, I thought it was kind of fitting that we would do some activities that involve both space and pi. Um, because if you go into, if you were to say, go into a science or math related career or work for NASA, the odds are you'd be using the number pi a lot. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Darcy or Anna, would you mind posting the two links on the screen into the chat so that uh, our people can look at them concurrently? Yeah, I'll post that right now. All right. And I think I need to... And then can... Uh, do you see do you see the new new thing I, that I pulled up or do you still see the presentation tab on my screen share? I see the new NASA okay. Jet Propulsion Lab. Great, fantastic. So the, this first uh, this first activity that we're going to do is uh, it's going to be about the Curiosity rover. And the basic idea is we're going to use the fact that the wheels are circles to figure out how far it's traveled because the Curiosity rover doesn't have an odometer. So it doesn't just track the distance, but it does, what, what is tracked is the number of rotations the wheel has done. So we know the diameter is 50 centimeters. So the diameter of each of these wheels is 50 centimeters. And they've rotated 3,689.2 times during their mission. So the, the, the goal here is to calculate how many kilometers Curiosity has traveled. So I, I, get, I guess what we'll do is uh, we'll give everyone, if people are interested, uh, we'll give people a minute to work through it, and then we'll go over it on the screen. Uh, all right, so I'll show you guys what my work was for this. Um, so I made these drawings on my computer with a little tablet pen. So I'm very proud of them. Please don't criticize my beautiful Mars rover. It's just like curiosity. So the basic idea is we have these wheels and this is a bigger version of the wheel. So they have a radius R, which is half the diameter. So the radius is, uh, that's a typo, the radius is 25 centimeters. Um, so the circumference of the wheel, which is the distance around the wheel, basically, is 2 pi times that radius. And that's the circumference. So if the wheel rotates a full, like one full rotation, that means that it's traveled, uh, that means that the rover has had to travel that same distance, c equals 2 pi r. So it travels the circumference for every rotation it makes. And we know that it's done 3,689.2 rotations. So then it's just a fairly simple um, arithmetic. You just multiply the number of rotations times the circumference. So it's 2 pi nr, and that works out to be 5.8 kilometers. All right, 
And the next problem that we do is a little bit harder. Uh, and this is actually related to the talk that we gave today because it's about insight and figuring out the distance to a figuring figuring out the distance to uh how do you say a distance to the epicenter of an earthquake or a mars quake so the basic idea is that you have this uh the insight lander sitting on mars and it, it there's there's a quake and the quake you know you would hope it would create surface waves it turns out that it didn't so this is more of a hypothetical exercise but if the quakes did detect create surface waves that are detectable by insight, you could use those surface waves to figure out where, how far away from you the quake occurred. Because basically insight would detect three waves at three different times. So at the first time, which they decided to call R1, it would detect a wave that traveled the shortest distance from the epicenter to the lander. So that would be the wave that went from here traveled across the surface of Mars to here. And then the second time would be the wave that went in the other direction. So that's R2, and that's the one that went around the surface of the planet. And it comes all the way over back to here. And then the third time, which is R3, is actually the first wave after it's gone past the rover the first time, or the lander the first time, then comes all the way around the planet and, and is detected again at time R3. So with those three times, it's actually possible to calculate a few things. First of all, you could calculate the speed of the wave. Second of all, you could calculate the, uh, what they're calling delta, but it's just the angular distance to the wave. So it's just like the angle from the rover to the wave, to, to the, not the wave, to the epicenter of the quake where the quake occurred. And finally, you can calculate T naught, which is actually the time at which the earthquake occurred. Um, so NASA is nice and gives us these nice formulas for it so we don't have to derive it ourselves. Uh, but basically, here's my horrible drawing of it with the same sort of thing. A uh, couple things that I added, you see, this is insight, this is the quake. So I drew these two angles. So the first angle is from insight to the epicenter. So that's theta one, I called it. And the other one is theta two. And you'll notice that theta one plus theta two is a full, full like go around a circle. It's like a full full rotation around a circle. So it adds up to 360 degrees or two pi radians, which is another unit of angle angle measurement. So you can just think of two pi radians as being the same thing as 360 degrees or going all the way around a circle. So the first thing you would do is you'd convert, you know, you'd convert the radii or not the radii, I don't know why they called them R. It's very, it's very annoying. I keep wanting to say radii, but they, you convert the times at which it detected these waves into seconds. So you have this, and then you just use these formulas. So first of all, you'd calculate the speed. So you can actually understand this, the formula for the speed pretty quickly. So it's a speed in uh, radians per second. So basically you're saying, you know, remember R3, is the time when this wave has come all the way around the all the way around the planet again and come back to the lander. So R3 minus R1 would be the time that it takes for the wave to go all the way around the planet. And two pi is the angle, the angular distance that it would that it would travel around the planet. So just dividing the distance by the time, that's speed. So that's how you get U. And then delta is a little more complicated. Delta is the distance to the epicenter of the quake. So it's this, it's really, uh, it's, it's the same thing as this angle theta one that I drew here. I should call it delta. But it's just the, the angular distance from insight to the epicenter where the quake sort of occurred. And this basically just comes from the fact that the sum of, you know, delta or theta one plus theta two 
is equal to a full two pi radians or 360 degrees. And I'm not going to do the math for this because it's probably not worth it, but that's sort of where it comes from if you want to try to figure it out. Uh, so if you calculate those two numbers, you find the speed of the wave is 9.7 times 10 to the negative four radi radians per second. And the angular distance is 0 0.61 radians. So those are two useful things to know. And you can finally calculate when the wave happens just by uh, doing a quick kind of, the idea is that R1 is the time at which, you know, the wave has uh, arrived from, you know, traveled through this distance delta or theta one. So it's the time that the wave takes to go from this epicenter of the earthquake to insight. So R1 would be T naught, which is the time at which the wave uh, or the earthquake occurs. It would be T naught plus the time it takes to get there. So it would be the T naught plus the time it takes to get to R1, I mean, to the lander. And that would just be delta over U because delta is the distance and U is the speed. So that gives you a time because it, it would be, um, Distance, I, no, that's not what I wanted. I can annotate. There we go. Distance is delta over uh, speed. That's, that's not clear at all, but the point is it would be the distance is in radians. and the speed is in radians per second. So what you get is it cancels out to seconds. So that's basically delta over U is just the time it takes the, the, the wave to get there. So that means T naught would just be R1 minus delta over U. And if you do that, you get 30,000 uh, 462 seconds, which kind of converts to a, um, you can convert it to about 8.30 a.m. in U UTC time. Uh, so that's, that's everything I have for the activity. Uh, now, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to ask them. But otherwise, uh, that's our talk. So thank, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, and it looks like we do have another question from Dick Hendrickson. Uh, so do you think Mars is heated by internal friction, radioactivity, or something else? Uh, I can take that unless you guys want to. So uh, that, that is a good question. Um, there's a, the two main sources of heat for a planet or I shouldn't say heat, but just, oh yeah. This, the two main sources of heating for a planet are the leftover energy from its formation. So it starts out very, very hot. And, you know, like for example, the Earth, Mars, they started out likely as kind of molten balls of rock to some extent. Um, so they started out very, very hot and it slowly cooled off. So the heat from the formation, that's sort of the first, uh, the first uh, component. And then the other main one is like you said, radioactivity. Um, radioactive decay provides like a significant amount of heating and the more radioactive isotopes that you have in a core, the longer a planet is going to stay warm. As for internal friction, that's a good question, actually. I don't think that plays what you would call a dominant role. But if Mars did have, say, a liquid core that was rotating in the center, like the Earth sort of does, maybe, uh, maybe there would be some friction between layers there. But I, I don't think it's a dominant source of heating. 
All right, any other questions? All right, so I think uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming and sticking with us. Uh, if you want more talks like this or about different topics, we do these every two weeks. So it, uh, in two weeks from now, a different set of presenters will be talking about another fun astro topic. So if you're interested, you can check out the MIFA Universe at Home website and sign up for that. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much and have a good night. Okay, we're done.